Isn't it so funny how parents, when you're a child, say under 16, are so hard on like being the protector, giving you the advice, putting up the guardrails, showing you the way. And then as an adult, when you reflect and you're like, hmm, that affected me in this way. And you're just honestly reflecting. It's like, hands off. It's, and, and they take it so personally, but like the upbringing was so personal. Like mm-hmm. how could it not? And it's this interesting like invitation to separate. My, you know? my, my mom's always like, well, you know, I was the worst mother. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was like complete like, she was like, well, you know, just... <laughs> Because I don't think they have like the mental ability to process a lot of it and understand too that it's like it you can have said that and still be a good parent. It's, exactly. It's like, I think their generation hid almost everything. It was sort of, you never told anyone that you were having problems with your marriage or with your kids or money. It was always so hidden and buried. And now people are so much more open and honest for better or for worse. And it's really almost important to our journey when we talk about the hard times. And I think sometimes it goes a little too far right where it's like a Mm -hmm. trauma competition. But I really think that there was just, they didn't share anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it's tough too, because with social media, it's so out there. So we don't realize too, she's like, my friends read your... Instagram posts and and they tell me, oh, this happened. And, and it's like, like do you they know, like my twerking? <laughs> exactly. But it's like, we don't realize it's like, I'm sharing it to my community in my community are my mom's friends, you know? And those, are, and those are the very people that she would never want to read these things. So, you know, it's so hard because it is such a cathartic process to share your story. And for some people it is on social media or online or with strangers. And it's a hard battle of knowing what you can share and how you can be responsible respectful at the same time. And it's like this constant dance that I think our generation is going to figure out. I mean, our kids are going to be like, yo, fuck my parents. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Dude, me in high school, if I had like Twitter, oh my God. My mom just yelled at me. She's such a bitch. Yeah, yeah. literally. It's like, she'll never understand me. Um, I think something you said was super important about when finding your dharma and pursuing your dharma, it's the strength piece. Yeah. And I think that's what's missing for a lot of people. I think people do have a hard time connecting with what could be their dharma because we don't slow down and among other things, but I really think the strength is the most important piece. And I think Mm. for me, that was my differentiator. That's why I have what I have is because not only my strength, but my willingness to go there, to look stupid, to do the different thing. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I write about you guys in the book. (laughs) (laughs) That's why we're here. (laughs) But we're going to read it word for word. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. Um, 100%. So the main obstacles that are keeping people from living their dharma, the number one is confusion of feeling this, I don't know what to do with the social media world. There's so many you know, possibilities out there. You're like, someone's a travel blogger. Someone's a mom. Someone has like this business. Someone has this epic job. So but you that's don't also know- in a way procrastination mm-hmm. for people. Confusion is like mostly procrastination. Yeah. And I don't even think confusion exists. So I was always labeled as confused. You're confused. You don't know what you want, but confusion is actually a higher vibration than apathy. Apathy means you don't care. You're not even questioning. Confusion means you're in the process of evaluating mm. your own truth. It's a beautiful thing to be confused. That means you're asking what else could be out there. I'm I'm weighing different options. I'm thinking of possibilities. It's it's that vata dosha, the air energy. If we don't go through confusion, we'll never get through clarity. So when people look at us, you're confused. That means you're getting the wheels going. So the second reason why is people feeling they're not enough. So people feeling like someone else is doing it, which is one of the biggest things. Someone else is already writing a book on that. Someone else is already talking about that. Someone else is smarter than me, wiser than me, fitter than me, thinner than me, whatever it is. And I share in the book that the very things that you're the most ashamed about are the actual things that you should be leading with because those are the things that let your people find you. So the number one reason, like this is an actual scientific research. The number one reason why people don't like others is a feeling that they're fake. Mm. So why are we trying to create this perfect picture and be this perfect person and be rich enough, smart enough, whatever it is enough, when the number one reason people actually don't vibe with someone else is feeling like they're too fake? So those very things that you're the most ashamed about, maybe you're like really into anime or like BDSM or, you know, for me, I'm like talking about Ayurveda and the Vedas. I twerk, I belly dance, I DJ, like all these things that I was like, no one can know that about me. Mm -hmm. That will stay in the closet. But 
I remember I actually, and this is a really good question for people to ask if they're like super confused of their purpose is ask your family or friends or community, when have you seen me at my best? So I wrote on my Instagram, like, when have you seen me at my best? And all of the ones were like, when you were dancing, when you were DJing. I'm like, wait, I write about all of these doshas every day. And, <laughs> and like that's and that's how you that's how you remember seeing me at my best because I was alive. I was yeah. invigorated. I was inspired. I was in passion. So the more I would bring that, of course, there were going to be some people that don't like that, but those aren't my people. So I share, write your five uncomfortable truths, the five things you don't want people to know about you. And how can you incorporate that into your dharma? Mm -hmm. So then another reason why the third is they don't know where to start. So feeling like, I know I want to do this thing. I don't know where to start. There's so, it seems like there's so many options. Do I start with a course? Do I just do it? And the thing is, there's never going to be a perfect way to start because every single person's journey in my perspective, every soul's experience will need a unique curriculum. So in the Vedic perspective, and Veda's being the sister science of yoga, Ayurveda, Vedic astrology, which we spoke about, each of our souls chose to incarnate in this earth school for a reason. And that reason is to live our purpose, to live our dharma. And that dharma is to raise the vibration of the planet. So all of us actually truly have the same dharma. However, we have each chosen unique parents, obstacle situations, bodies, environments, archetypes, doshas, astrology, all of the things so we can embody that purpose. So if you were here to make the world laugh and think and feel, you are going to be born with more entertainer, more vata, more maybe parents who, you know, loved your jokes or something like that. Like Jim Carrey, right? He was just born. He, he chose all of that from a Vedic perspective. Tony Robbins, he needed to have a mother who wasn't there for him and learn to speak up for himself or Wayne Dyer or everyone had, you know, especially if you had a difficult childhood, I always say you were born into the microcosm of what you were here to solve. So, you know, I was born into child marriage. My grandma was 12 years old when she was married and everyone in my lineage before that as well. I was born into patriarchy. No one in my family has worked, you know, refugee, asylum, political prisoner. That's all part of my ancestry. And that's what I'm here to solve. For someone else, that could be addiction. It could be trauma. It could be sexual assault. And you were born into the microcosm of what you're here to solve because you can love those people. You can see them for who they are. You can understand what are the footsteps of my mom when she's drunk? How is she showing up differently? And you can get to know addiction from such a deep level that when you go about solving it, it's not this thing that you're on the outside of. You are so deeply entrenched in it that you can come into it from an insider's perspective. So a lot of people say it's not fair. Why do some people have more difficult lives than others? And that means that's their soul's unique curriculum for them to embody their dharma. So it's not about negating it or pretending it didn't happen, but it's actually about what is the lesson that this taught me. And it can be very, very difficult because we can look at examples of people who never did find their purpose and say, you know, again, why was my grandma married when she was 12 years old and like never, never even got to go to school? You know, why, how come she didn't get to live her Dharma? And this is such a universal question that I think the, you know, the Buddha sat with since the beginning of time. It's like, why, why is life not fair? And to me, it comes down to what story do you want to operate from? The story that I choose to operate from is that my obstacles have been my soul's training, have given me strength, have given me courage, have given me experience to fulfill my dharma. But not everyone is going to choose that story or feel even feel you know in alignment with that story. You don't have to be. However, to me, it's the most empowering because it takes me out of victimhood of what's happened to me and puts me into my creatrix consciousness of how can I use these now to my benefit? How can this be in my sacred cauldron? You know, we each, especially as women, we have the wombs, we have the cauldron. What was in your cauldron and how can you turn that into alchemy? It's not about, you know, nothing was ever in my cauldron and now I can live my dharma. You know, that's your potion, that's your medicine, and that's what you get to bring out to the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for tuning in to Morning Microdose by Almost 30. We hope you enjoyed waking up. As always, we encourage you to take what resonates and leave the rest. If you enjoyed this trip, tune into the full episode on the Almost 30 podcast. All episode information can be found in the show notes. Make sure to subscribe. And if this becomes a part of your morning routine, be sure to share it with a friend. We have new inspiring doses Monday through Friday. Follow us on Instagram at Morning Microdose. And follow Almost 30 at Almost 30 Podcast. 
Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the vortex.